Mr. Wall, thank you, Jane Goodhall, for joining us here. Um, the last time we spoke, it was to mark World Environment Day, just as so many countries across Europe were just about ending their lockdowns and starting to lift restrictions. Here we are now in the beginning of what some are calling the second wave of this pandemic. Do you think we've begun to start learning the lessons yet? Well, if people honestly can't understand the need to protect themselves, my, my mission is not really to combat the COVID pandemic. My mission is to help people understand that we, in part, brought it on ourselves by our disrespect of nature and our disrespect of animals. So we push animals in closer contact with humans. We hunt them, eat them, uh, traffic them, sell them as exotic pets around the world. We put them in factory farms in terrible close conditions. And all these situations can lead to an environment where a pathogen like a virus can jump from an animal to a person where it may form a new disease like COVID-19. But more globally, you know, you are talking about educating and changing people's behaviours here, and this is part of what your Roots and Shoots programme aims to achieve. Tell us more about it. Yes, well, <clears throat> Roots and Shoots began in 1991 because I was meeting young people who seemed to have lost hope. They were learning about what we're doing to the planet, how we're uh, polluting, we're destroying rainforests and... Uh, polluting the ocean and destroying our land with the poisonous chemical pesticides and, and herbicides. And young people are losing hope because they told me, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do. And yes, we are stealing their future, but there is something that can be done. So Roots and Jutes, which is now in 65 countries, is allowing young people from kindergarten through university to choose three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And they talk about what they care about, what they think they can do, and then they roll up their sleeves and they get out there and they take action. So it's the taking action, seeing that what you do as a group makes a difference, knowing that other groups are also making a difference. And then that it, that empowers young people and they then feel hopeful and determined. You mentioned that you're in nearly 70 countries around the world now. How do these different groups of young people sort of communicate between themselves to share this message? Because obviously it's not just the young people, it's the sort of the older people and whose hearts and minds need to change as well. We began in 91 with high school students. Some of those are in decision-making places now. There are teachers and there are parents. So it's become a sort of circular, uh, and it, it definitely changing minds. It is definitely making a difference. It is definitely empowering young people. You mentioned young people there. I'm really interested to know about what you were like when you were younger. What led you to get into conservation? Well, I was born loving animals. I grew up right here where you see me now. I had a wonderful supportive mother. There was no television when I was growing up. So I learned by being out in nature, in the garden that we have, and on the cliff above the sea. And I learned from books, 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 books. So a lot of the books that I read as a child are here. I read Dr. Doolittle, and I read Tarzan. And when I was 10, I determined I would go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. And everybody laughed at me, except my wonderful mother, who you see behind me. And here she is. And uh, she, she just said to me, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, and if you don't give up, maybe you find a way. And that's the message that I take to young people all around the world, particularly those in disadvantaged communities. And so many have come up and said, Jane, thank you, you fought me. Because you did it, I can do it too. Yeah, you know, I was really interested in to know about you know the the practical approaches that the young people who are involved in your Roots and Shoots program are doing on a day to day basis. You know, tell me more about that. The main message of Roots and Shoots is that every day you live, you make some impact, and you can choose what sort of impact you make. So, uh, at least if you come from a 
reasonably wealthy family, and this does not apply to those living in poverty who just have to do whatever they can to stay alive. But providing you can make a choice as to what you buy, where did it come from, how was it made, did it harm the environment, was it cruel to animals, is it cheap because of child slave labor uh, or bad wages for the people making it. And if millions and then billions of people make ethical choices in how they live, then we move towards a better world. They're suggesting that it would be much better to subsidize new technologies for renewable energy than to go on subsidizing oil and gas companies and giving them tax breaks and so on. Okay. Let me ask you about two things you just mentioned there, because you, you, you spoke about how it's important to get this message across to disadvantaged families. You know, it, it might be easier for children or younger people who do come from uh, more well-off families, their parents perhaps are more educated to implement these things, but how do you get that message across to the, the less disadvantaged teenagers and children? You know, is it just about planting trees? Well, to start with, um, if we go to Africa, where you know I've spent so much of my life, <clears throat> and we go to the chimpanzee habitats, because of course I spent years and years and years living with chimpanzees in the rainforest, and it was when I realized that, that the rainforests were disappearing, the chimps were losing their habitat, and although that was partly due to big companies coming in from outside, logging and mining and so forth, in part, it was because there were more people living in a certain area than the land could support, too poor to buy food elsewhere. And so they were cutting down their last trees in their desperate effort to grow food. And this was when I realized, if we don't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying their environment, then we can't hope to save the chimpanzees. And so the Jane Goodall Institute began our program, Take Care, or Takari, which is now in six African countries. It's very holistic, and it's in the hands of the people. And they've even learned at workshops sophisticated technology. They use cell phones. They can monitor the health of their forest. And the wonderful thing is that if you give nature time, it's very resilient. So where, when I flew over Gombe in 90, what had been part of a great forest, was just a tiny area of forest surrounded by hill, bare hills. Now that we've worked with the people, and they've understood that protecting the environment is for their own future, not just saving wildlife. They've become our partners. And fly over it today, you won't see the bare hills. And so in all of the villages, in Tanzania, it's 104 villages, through the chimp range. All of those villages have roots and shoots programs for young people. And they're, they're learning about the animals. They're learning how to use smartphones. They're communicating with, with other children in other parts of Africa, other parts of the world. Uh, yes, they are planting trees. Everywhere people are planting trees. But they're also learning about, you know, the danger of plastic and, and um, the danger of soil erosion if you cut down the trees on the steep slope. So it, it's learning and acting together. Earlier on, you mentioned that you, you know, Roots for Shoots isn't an aggressive organization. Does that mean that that you're not sort of, or you wouldn't advocate the, the sort of, let's say, the, the stance taken by Extinction Rebellion? Do you not think there's room for that also on the environmental agenda? Well, I think, yes, Extinction Rebellion, um, student marches, that's raising awareness about climate change. But the, my, my own method has always been, if you want change, you have to, it has to come from within the person. So I try to tell stories to reach the heart rather than fight with the head. Because very often, a um, person in power, an older person, an older male particularly, they don't want to listen to me. They don't want to listen to a kid. But if you can reach into the heart, and I do that by telling stories, and so often it does work. 
Wonderful stories they are too. It's been fascinating speaking to you today, Jane Guildhall. I wish we had all day, but unfortunately uh, we don't. But thank you very much for taking time to speak to me here again on the programme. Well, it's great speaking to you as well, and bye.